Well, it's good to be with you today. We're having to get together by means, uh, by this means, rather than actually in person because of the coronavirus that is uh, active in the city of El Paso. But I appreciate you joining with us in this manner. What we hope to have is a little over 30 minutes of the of God. We uh, will not have any singing, uh, any worship today, but there will be the ministry of the Word of God. My name is Ron Fox. I serve as pastor of Valley New Baptist Church here in El Paso. I'm going to start with a word of prayer. One thing we like to do as a congregation is to uh, hear a song. And uh, Brother Tom will be coming and reading a song right after we pray. And then we'll consider the word of God together. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you as honestly as we know how. And Lord, we enjoy coming into your presence. We want to worship you in spirit and truth. We desire to draw close to you. Lord, you always have time for us if we make time for you. Lord, you are welcome in our hearts. You are welcome at this time. Lord, look at my heart. Look at every heart of those that are listening right now. Is there anything that would keep us from hearing your voice? Is there anything that would keep us from doing what you tell us? Lord, if so, would you please bring it to our attention? We want to turn it over to you. We want to confess it. We want to forsake it. Lord, we don't want this to be wasted time. We ask that this time would count for eternity. So Lord, take over by your Holy Spirit. Please share your will with us. Father, there are some who are listening and they really need a touch from you. They have cares and they have burdens. Lord, I pray that everyone will be lifted. There are those who need encouragement, guidance, and direction. And Lord, there are those who are searching. They need you. They need you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. And I ask that even this day, they would be born again in Christ. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Brother Tom's coming to share a song with us. Tom? This reading is of Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Amen. Good word. Now, those who have access to your Bibles, you'll get your Bibles. And open them to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, uh, we will read it together. So you hang in there. It's a fairly long song. And then we'll go back and hit the highlights and see what the Lord has for us this day. So open your Bibles to Psalm 37. We will begin reading at verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. Verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him. 
for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Verse 17. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke, they shall vanish away. Verse 21. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous show mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Verse 27. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord. Keep his way. He shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. Verse 35. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Now we need to pray just a little bit again. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have taught us that as we gather together in your presence, we are to include the reading aloud of your word, and that's what we're doing. Lord, we acknowledge that this psalm is the word of God. You have given it by your spirit. You have preserved it. You have brought it forward in the language that we think in. And today it has been brought to our attention. It is on our hearts. Holy Spirit, explain this passage to each one of us in a way that we can grasp, that we can understand, and then grant us faith and power to put into practice what you teach us this day. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This particular song uh, is written through David. This is King David. Uh, it's a very encouraging song. The author of the psalm is the Holy Spirit. The individual that the Holy Spirit speaks through is King David. The time of David's life is given to us in two passages. You probably noticed it as we read them together. In verse 25, here's what we learn. 
David says, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends and his descendants are blessed. Now, Scripture interprets Scripture, so we read other passages in the Bible. And when we look at those history books, which are about the life of David, we, we know that David lived to be age 70. The last 18 months of his life, he was not in good health. He was confined to the palace. Many times he was bedridden. He had a private duty nurse. The last year of his reign, he actually shared with his son Solomon, they were co-regents, he was finishing up his reign and Solomon was learning how to serve as the king. So the best we can figure, this is written between age 65 and 70 for David. He classifies himself as an old man. If you think of the, what we know about his life, he says that in all of his life, he had never seen the righteous forsaken and that he had never seen their children begging bread. First time we meet David, there was conflict in the land. You know, in David's lifetime, there were uh, many invasions. Uh, there were neighboring nations who wanted to conquer Israel and they would invade and Israel would have to defend themselves and sometimes there was a refugee problem and of course then they would have to uh, raise an army and they would have to fight against the invaders as a young man David the youngest uh, of his family all of his brothers were older than he was he his testimony was that as he was assigned to keep his father's sheep that he learned how to defend himself against attack. And that there was a time that a lion came and he killed that lion. There was a time that a bear came and he killed that bear. And he's still in his early teenage years when those events take place. He would know how to use the staff. He would know how to use the rod. He would know how to use the sling. He knew what it was to be on his own in dangerous situations as a young man. But he said that God never forsook him. He came to know the Lord at a very young age, and then there was this great relationship that was nurtured, and he continued to grow in his faith and in his fellowship with the Lord, and there's certain key times in, in David's life that God wants us to know about. There are sections of David's life that we know nothing about, but there are certain key areas that the Holy Spirit has recorded and he has preserved, and when we study them, it is God speaking directly to our heart. That's what this Bible study is today. This is a direct word of the Lord to every open heart. Each one who has an open heart and you're searching for the Lord and you want to hear from God and you want to know his will, you will hear from God today. God will speak to you directly out of this testimony that comes toward the end of David's life. David, uh, as he went through that first invasion of the Philistines, do you remember that he went to visit his brothers that were in camp. The older brothers were serving in the army and his dad sent them to check up on them. That's when he first went against Philistines. It's when he defeated Goliath. You start from there and you're going to see many wars that he will fight in. You will see a civil war that comes upon his country. There will be times that he had to flee as an outlaw, that the government declared him to be an outlaw and were trying to kill him, he had to flee. Those who helped him would have to flee. His family had to be moved to Moab for safety for a while. Uh, there were folks as he hid in the wilderness, they came out first just by a few and then by hundreds they came. Uh, fleeing because of the problems, because of the difficulty. It says they were in distress, they were in debt, they were in despair. Later when he becomes king and he has to lead folks in battle, and then toward the end of his life there's rebellion in his family and he has to flee through all of those events, through all of those events, which would literally just turn your life upside down. His testimony is, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. God took care of his righteous, uh, those who were the redeemed, 
those who trusted in him uh, under the most difficult of circumstances. And David's testimony under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is that he never saw in any of that time the kids having to bake bread. God always took care of them. Sometimes they had to move around. They didn't know where that next meal was coming from. They didn't know where the shelter was going to be, but God provided in every situation. That's quite a testimony. We also discovered in verse 35 another thing that David said that he had discovered that he had personally experienced. And let me read it. Let me remind you. Verse 35 we read, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. There were times that David, doing the right thing, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, declared to be righteous before God, had to flee. There were those who were wicked, and those who were evil, and those who were covetous, and those who had no heart for the things of God, who, who appeared to grow rich. Uh, they appeared to have the power. They appeared to be those that were controlling the situation. And so they're declared to be wicked, but he says, I saw them in great power. It's just as if I was looking at a great tree, a beautiful tree, and it's magnificent and it's wonderful. He said, yet he passed away and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him and he could not be found. He says, I have seen those who looked like they were getting ahead by fighting the move of God's spirit in their generation, by being self-centered, by being covetous, by being evil, and they didn't think they would ever have to answer. He says, I watched judgment come quickly in their individual lives. They were there one day, and then they were gone the next. It's important to remember these testimonies toward the end of the psalm as we consider the purpose of the psalm. So let's go back now to Psalm 37, verse 1. You'll notice that as we have read the psalm, there are a number of commands that are spoken to those who are followers of Christ, those who love Jesus. We don't expect folks who have no heart for God to take seriously the commands of the Word of God, but for those who are born again in Christ, those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we now recognize Jesus' authority. He has every right to give us commands, every right to tell us how to live. He's the one who declares what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, uh, what he likes, what he dislikes, uh, what's moral, what is immoral, how we should use our time, how we shouldn't use our time, how we should use our funds, how we shouldn't use our funds. Jesus has every right to declare that to those who belong to him, who are the redeemed. Uh, because Jesus becomes our master and we are his servants once we are redeemed, once we are the same. We are part of the family of God. He has every, every right to give us counsel as we gather together in his presence, as our heavenly father uh, manifests his presence. God has every right as a loving father to instruct us as his children, just as we want uh, God's best and what is best for our children. God wants his best for us. So there are some commands that are given here. Uh, anytime God issues commands, it is wise for us to screen that in our own life and see if we take that seriously or not. If we follow his command, then we get his results. And if we ignore his commands, then we get tripped up by the enemy. The psalm starts with, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. When we go through crisis times as a people, and we're going through a crisis time uh, as a nation right now because of the coronavirus, and we're still early in that uh, uh, it's that pestilence being exposed across our land and there are changes that are being made and already we see uh, the very best in human behavior and the very worst 
in human behavior. Uh, there are those who are reaching out to their neighbors. There are those who are risking their life to be a blessing to those round about. There are those who are checking on others. There are those who are sharing freely. There are those when it comes to uh, shopping and all, they just take what they need and they leave that for their neighbor. And, and there are those who, who are going above and beyond to be a blessing to folks round about. This is good. This is pleasing in the Lord's sight. We also discover that there are those who are doing evil things and wicked things and out of covetousness are trying to uh, make a buck off of people's heartache and they're trying to swindle those who don't understand what's going on or those who may not be familiar on how to use computer skills or online skills or especially the elderly are being targeted by folks at a very difficult time there are those who are doing evil things and wicked things and there has to be a warning of scammers and and watch out for this type of behavior and that type of behavior and we hear those testimonies as well and it can make you very angry inside when something like that takes place but anytime there's a crisis anytime there's some sort of natural disaster or anything you'll see the very best uh, come out of some folks and then you'll see the very worst that which god calls uh, those who are being evildoers and the command is, do not fret because of evil doers. God is aware of what's taking place. There is a day of judgment. There is a day of accountability. God's on the job. He is going to take care of that. When it says, do not fret, fret means to burn with anger. You just stoop about it. You're just upset about it. How could anybody be so mean? God says, don't do that. Don't do that. Do not fret because of evildoers. He says, uh, turn them over to me and you do what you're supposed to do. Now, God would never tell us not to do something unless he gives us something positive to put in its place. We really appreciate the Lord commanding us not to worry, not to fret, not to be anxious. It's the most often repeated command that is found in scripture. For those who count them up, depending on whose list you read, there's either 365 or 366. Uh, I've heard both numbers of those uh, uh, commands not to be anxious, not to worry, not to be fearful. Uh, do not be afraid. Most often repeated command in scripture because God knows us. He knows the way we are. Uh, we have, we do worry, we are anxious. And so as soon as that comes, then we have to obey God's command. Don't fret, don't be anxious, don't worry. Okay, what do we put in its place? If God says the amount of time that you would put into fretting or worrying or being anxious, what should you do? And here we have this command right after the command not to fret and just to let these folks, God's gonna take care of them. Verse three, we have this command, trust in the Lord and do good dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. If there's ever a model for a time of crisis for the follower of Jesus Christ, it would be Psalm 37, verse three, trust in the Lord and do good. You say, what am I supposed to do today? You're to trust in the Lord and do good. You rest in the Lord, you put your faith in the Lord. To, to put faith in someone is to rest in the work that they have done. You are trusting in what they have accomplished. To trust in the Lord is to obey the counsel that he gives us for the various stages of life. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Be a witness in the land. Don't go. Uh, don't run away. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Verses 3 and 4 are a great promise. For those of you who are followers of Christ for just a short period of time, you probably already heard about this promise. For those who served the Lord for a long time, it's probably one that you have memorized. It is good to remind yourself the promises of God in difficult situations. The commands continue. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. 
rest in the Lord, still in command form, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. In a very short period of time, the Lord has to remind us again and again that we are not to fret, we are not to be angry, we are not to be vengeful or to seek wrath. He says this is only going to cause harm. Who's it going to cause harm to? First, it's going to cause harm to you. It's going to affect your relationship with the Lord. And it's going to affect your relationship with those who are around about. So if you are upset and angry and mad because of uh, you see people prospering in difficult times because of evil deeds, commit those folks into the Lord's hands and get back to doing every day what you're supposed to do. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Commit your way to the Lord. Let him be a partner with you, a guide, a director in what he has called you. Right now, we find ourselves in a unique situation. We have some folks that are working uh, more than they've ever worked in their life. There are those who are considered to be essential to our economy, essential to our city, essential to this nation. And so they are working long hours and they very often put themselves in difficult positions. We pray and intercede for those who are the healthcare workers and those who are in law enforcement and those who are part of the food distribution and those who are part of the transportation and the supply lines that are needed and necessary. Uh, for those who continue with the utilities and for those in, in communication, all of these are essential jobs. But many folks have been told to work from home and many folks have been told to shelter in place and so it takes a lot of patience and understanding to shelter in place. It takes all of us pulling together to be victorious over this. And you cannot afford to be upset. You cannot afford to be first fearful of what might be coming because God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You cannot afford to be angry at those who seem to be uh, getting rich over other people's misery. You can't fret over it. You cannot come up with schemes on how to get revenge or to be wrathful. God says, stay away from those attitudes. They will only cause harm. It will cause, it will rob you of your peace. It will break fellowship with the Lord. And it's going to cause problems in your personal relationships. So if you see those things beginning to settle in, then obey the command of the Lord. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. And God gives you his personal word that he is on the job. If there are evildoers who are as bad as you think they are, then God says he's going to take care of them. He's going to, there'll be a day of judgment. There's a time that they will be cut off. That is his business. So we release people to the Lord. We place them in God's hands. If there is any vengeance, it is God's vengeance. If there's anyone who needs to take care of, it's him. You need to do that which you know to be good, that which is to be a blessing, to be a bright light for the Lord, dispelling darkness, to be an encourager, a comforter, an exhorter to those round about. The way you do that is you start each day in the Lord's presence. Each day, start off with a time of, of searching God's word, finding out what's on God's heart to your heart. Spend time in prayer. Have a conversation with the Lord. It's great when you can combine your Bible study with prayer because as you search the word of God, as you're reading the word of God, asking the Holy Spirit to be in charge, God begins to speak to your heart. And he, if there's certain things he'll convict you of, and then you share your heart with him. So God speaks to us by his word, and then we share our heart with him. After you've had this time in the Lord's presence, after you've received from the Lord, after you are full of the spirit of God to overflowing, then you are in a position to reach out and to be blessing to someone else. As followers of Christ, you and I have nothing to give to others unless first we receive from the Lord. 
So each day we want to receive and then we have something to pass on that day to be a blessing in the name of Jesus. If as we continue to search these scriptures, God gives details as to how he is going to handle the problem. And he encourages us to be meek. It says in verse 10, for yet a little while and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. To be meek, a biblical, think of meekness as spiritual flexibility. You have your will. You want to go this way. God has his will. He's going this way. When your will meets God's will, if you yield, then you are meek. You are spiritually flexible. If your will meets God's will and you do not yield, then that is pride. And the great danger of pride, we are taught, is that pride goes before destruction and a haughty look before a fall. You see, God resists the proud, is the teaching of Scripture, but God gives grace to the humble. That's what we want each day, to receive from the Lord grace. We want grace, we want mercy. Grace is God's free, unmerited favor to the undeserving. We don't deserve God's grace, but sovereign God has reached out to us by grace. Salvation is by grace through faith in what Jesus did on that cross. It's how we entered into our relationship with Christ. At some point, we had to humble ourselves. We had to admit we were sinners. We cried out for forgiveness, and Jesus was right there. You know, in salvation, as we cry out to the Lord, and, and Jesus meets us, when we're born again, there's an exchange of you know, we give our life to Christ. Jesus gives his life to us. He comes to live within us by his Holy Spirit. And now we don't have to live in our own power, but it's by Christ's power. It's not in our own strength, but it's in his strength. This is all based on mercy and grace. We've not earned this privilege. God has extended it because he loves us. After entering into this fellowship by grace, we live each day by grace. We admit that we don't know how to live this life, but that Jesus does. And we ask for his counsel and we submit to his guidance and his direction. Therefore, we are living in the power of grace. Grace is given each day. He'll give you what you need for that day. That's why it is fruitless to worry about tomorrow or about next month or next year because we have grace today. Tomorrow when you wake up, God will give you grace for that day. And it can be a good day in his presence. The only thing I know for sure about next week, about next month, about next year, is that Jesus is already there. And he can be trusted. We belong to him. If you've never made a commitment of your life to Christ, there's no time like the present to cry out to the Lord and ask for forgiveness of your sins and that Jesus would take control of your life. There's some wonderful promises as we wrap up our time. Verse 16 said, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. You know, for folks who have a wicked heart, they can have the whole world and they still don't have enough. <laughs> They'll never have enough. They'll always want more. But a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of the wicked. You say, what if I take this to heart and I put these scriptures into practice, but I fail one day? I goof, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't do what I should do. That was spoken of. Verses 23 and 24. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. In other words, what God wants from us is that we want to do what's right. Doesn't mean we always do what's right, but we want to do what's right. We want to try. We're asking Jesus to be in charge. We want to cooperate. We have no desire 
to fight God. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. But then it says, though he fall. How about that? Every now and then, folks who love Jesus fall. We gave it our best, but for whatever reason, it, it, we didn't get the results that we should. We acted in the flesh, or we began to doubt. Something happened. It says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Jesus says to his followers, I will never leave you, nor forsake. And even on those days that we fall, the Lord is there to pick us up, to uphold us. If we have got ourselves in a mess through sin, we confess our sin, we forsake our sin, we receive our forgiveness, and we move on. This psalm ends in a, in a great declaration of victory. And let's go again at the very end of this psalm. Psalm 37, verse 39 says, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. God is your strength in time of trouble. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promises in Psalm 37. We thank you for your, your encouragement, your exhortation, your comfort. Father, there are those that you have spoke to out of passages here. We do not forget what you have laid on our heart. It's different for each one listening, but it's the same word. There's something you want to do within each one of us. Lord, that word which is now in our heart, that which we are thinking about, those passages out of the scripture, we want to continue to think about them until we know exactly what you are saying to us. And then show us how, Lord, to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless you. And remember, trust in the Lord and do good.